Welcome to the CE Pro Podcast. I'm Executive Editor Arlen Schweiger. You know, one thing the pandemic has created this year is a greater thirst for home audio solutions, which is sure to continue as the holiday shopping season is now upon us. But as consumers and integrators start setting up their new systems, how can they be sure to get the highest quality out of them? Senior Editor Bob Archer and I turn to an industry expert, Jerry LeMay, Director of the Home Acoustics Alliance, to learn more about uh, uh, audio calibration and offer insights into this practice. Jerry LeMay, Director of the Home Acoustics Alliance. Thanks for joining me and Senior Editor Bob Archer on the CE Pro Podcast. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Great. So let's dig into uh, some questions about home audio. Uh, you know, it seems that slowly the residential market is becoming more aware of the problems associated with room acoustics. Uh, do you think this awareness is simply a matter of the industry maturing, or do you think it's been more a result of EQ programs, driving interest, or a combination? Wow. Yeah, that's an amazing thing. I, and actually, that could have been asked 10 years ago, and probably 10 years before that, the uh, the public's uh, slowly increasing interest in acoustics. Uh, I think that you're onto something with the uh, these automated programs. I think that, uh, I remember, I think one of the first companies that ever had an automated calibration was uh, of all companies, Bose. And they had a little system, I believe it uh, had a microphone on a set of headphones or something like that. It may still exist, I don't, I don't know. But, uh, it was intriguing because uh, at the time it created a question mark that never existed in consumers' minds. That is calibration. What do you mean? Why does this need to be calibrated? Because, you know, from uh, most people's perspective, they uh, plug a speaker in, they turn it on, and it's either a really good sounding speaker or it's just a bad speaker. And so that that was kind of the uh, I guess the the line in the sand for and I'm talking about for the the larger consumer market because in the audiophile market I think there's always been some element of awareness. So uh, I do believe that it's becoming more of a thing, and uh, I think that uh, the immersive audio high channel count systems. Uh, certainly trend off with uh, the uh, uh, probably the first high-end company that create puts a premium on the need for calibration they certainly are recommending that to all of their dealers and that actually is not usual even though a lot of the manufacturers Denon you know, Onkyo, so on and so forth. They all have auto EQ systems of some sort. They all have calibration controls. They don't necessarily, or haven't, I shouldn't say now, but they haven't put that at the at the forefront of being a dealer and installing these products. Trinoff has. And I, so I think it's a combination of things. And uh, certainly the auto systems were a key part of that that increased awareness. So. Okay, uh, thank you, Jerry. Um, since we're talking about these e EQ programs, have you think these products improved over the years in your opinion? And maybe most importantly, would you trust an auto EQ program to tune your home theater? Well, uh, have they improved? Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any massive uh, research project where all of these uh, various auto systems are, you know, constantly refining their goal, their algorithms and such. I, I, I don't know that they've changed a lot over whatever, 10, 15 years. I think they, they certainly have incrementally improved. There's, I think there's some things that they've learned. I, I, I won't mention any names, but I know at least one manufacturer, the original uh, algorithm was refined in uh, large room acoustics and it was used for commercial systems and it worked very well and then when it came down to small rooms there were some things they that they didn't have factored in 
in a small room, like the high variability of sound quality as you move across very short distances in a small room. So um, improved, mm, perhaps incrementally. Uh, I think, would I use it? And the answer is, yeah. Uh, in fact, I uh, helped my son. He, uh, we put a little uh, Onkyo uh, THX home theater system into his home and uh, didn't have a lot of time. So we pulled out the little, the little hockey puck microphone and put it on the couch on a, on a headrest to press the button and it sounded better. Now that's not my, that, that, does, that does not happen in my mind every time. I I've sometimes have to press the button a few times, but uh, I think that they're very useful for the consumer. I think they can be useful for a uh, integrator who's in a hurry. But uh, if I'm going to go down on the mat uh, and depend on something, I'm going to, I want to do it myself. And, but we products today that are short of, as I mentioned, a trend off or something that has uh, independent processor built in, in the uh, uh, system, it's very difficult to hand tune these systems. Where I'll draw the line is it, no matter what automated system, I will still want to put a separate uh, DSP processor on the subs. Uh, the subs are the most important and frankly, that is where most of the auto systems fail. And so uh, if I'm going to uh, do a good calibration for someone, I'm going to put in a separate processor on the subwoofers, EQ them, and then I'll let the auto system uh, kind of pick up the pieces after that. It's a much easier job for the auto system uh, once you've conquered most of the base anomalies. So Jerry, in terms of uh, you know some of those larger rooms, obviously those are the kind of rooms that integrators are now outfitting with immersive audio formats that you know, use up a lot of a lot of channels, a lot of speakers. Um, does that place a greater emphasis on room acoustics, having many more speakers in a home? And maybe you can give us a little comparison between doing, you know, EQ for an immersive audio system versus just a stereo system. Well, first, let me kind of just make a quick note about the term larger. <laughs> you said a larger room. When I was talking about a larger room, I was talking about a like a commercial cinema and that's that's out of the realm of most uh you know of your ce pros uh so uh the larger rooms that you're talking about i believe are ones that can fit a lot of speakers in them and so uh the, the high channel count systems do present an increased level of complexity but in terms of room acoustics, I don't know that I could place, uh, you know, which which type of system has a greater dependency. They all do. You, you go to a two-channel system, tremendously dependent on room acoustics. Uh, you start putting, uh, you know, 21, 32, I don't know how many speakers into a room. Uh, does that re reduce the... Uh, uh, requirement for a lot of concern for room acoustics? And the answer is no, in my opinion. It's not that uh, all of a sudden we need to have, in order to make a high channel count system sound good, that we have to have, you know, panels of some ilk everywhere. That's not really the point. The point is that the room can either uh, contribute or it can detract. And you know, one of the problems, no matter how many speakers you have in the room, uh, a small room is inherently a non-diffusive space. And it's that diffusiveness that is a key element of what an acoustician is trying to uh, create, or if you will, recreate with speaker placement, with diffusiveness uh, in terms of acoustical treatments, with listener placement. So uh, frankly, when you start adding a lot more speakers in there, perhaps the uh, problem becomes even more difficult because at that point, you end up with a, an area of the room where the balance between all the speakers becomes smaller. And so, you know, and I, I don't want to go 
into a class here, but by having more speakers, you create the ability to have good uh, focus, meaning imaging from the various objects floating around the room. That becomes easier in a variety of seats. The problem you run into is that in a, in a typical home theater, even a large home theater, the area where all the speakers can be balanced is actually smaller. And so it, it becomes, again, a, a bit of a calculus to decide how many speakers should be in the room and uh, uh, then how many seats really make sense in the room. And then to try to enhance this uh, uh, effect with the proper acoustics. So, you know, without getting a chalkboard out, I guess that's my answer. <laughs> Okay, we don't uh, want you to get the chalkboard out, but I know Bob wanted to ask you a bit about the HAA curriculum. Yeah, yes. Uh, how, how has it evolved over the years to adapt to these new formats, including immersive audio and even high res audio? Yeah, well, that's that's an interesting question. And one of the things that I'm very proud of about Home Acoustics Alliance, HAA, is that uh, I think from the first class that we ever did, which uh, was a long time ago, uh, it was a matter of uh, evolution. In fact, I will say that probably the first mm, 10 years that we were doing classes, I don't know that we had any back-to-back -back classes that were the same. It seemed like every class there was a question, there was uh, an aha moment of mine, where I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's a better way of explaining this. And oh yeah, we really need to talk about that. And so if you were to somehow come up with a collection of all of our manuals, uh, I, was, I was constantly reprinting them. And uh, it, that, 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 while that change slowed over the years, it continues. And certainly immersive audio became a, a, a huge player in, in the training. Uh, oddly enough, though, the, the fundamentals of what we try to teach, and, and fundamentals are really a, a big part of the focus, are giving students a, uh, a knowledge base that allows them to become problem solvers. So if a guy's a problem solver, that means that he walks into a room and instead of just uh, looking at the rules and they say, well, put a speaker here, here, and here, the seat should go here, blah, blah, blah. He realizes, oh no, there's a giant moose head there. I can't put a speaker there. What, well, how do I, how do I uh, overcome this? And oh, by the way, uh, THX says to put a subwoofers here, here, and here, and there's no wall there. How do I, so, and, and, and that's, where, that's where problem solving runs to the forefront, because I think most integrators are going to tell you, they don't, they don't have the lucky uh, occasion all the time of having a nice rectangular room. And so there are anomalies, and, and, it, and, and so understanding those fundamentals means that they can possibly create some sort of a solution to a problem based upon their knowledge. Now, having said that, <clears throat> bringing in the idea of, you know, having more than 7.1 speakers. Uh, oddly enough, the fundamentals haven't really changed. Uh, we're talking about uh, trying to uh, identify the metrics of good sound. Those metrics remain unchanged. Uh, we're simply trying to, we're using a, a different method to, to recreate this concept of imaging floating through the room and enveloping sound fields and smooth deep bass. But the fact that there's more speakers doesn't change the fundamental uh, understanding of how each speaker needs to be positioned and calibrated and reproduced. What it does change is the time coefficient. <laughs> so you end up, instead of uh, painstakingly calibrating seven speakers and uh, a couple of subs, now you're looking at, you know, nine, 13, who knows, 21 uh, speakers. And if you're trying to do it meticulously, you're talking about a, a calibration that can take uh, all day and, and maybe a good chunk of the next day. So 
Um, in terms of HAA training, we are uh, evolving because we're figuring out how to explain things better and, and what's important to the integrators. But uh, the, uh, the fundamentals of understanding sound and proper calibration uh, are pretty constant, whether you're doing a two channel system or you're, you're doing the, the whole you know, giant uh, immersive audio system. So Jerry, let's just talk, uh, touch a little bit more on some of those fundamentals, because I think, you know, as you know, integrators do have a range of education and awareness when it comes to calibration and exactly, you know, just what calibration means. So we were wondering, you know, just as a, as a baseline service, what should integrators be doing to audio systems, you know, after they install them, uh, you know, before they sort of, quote unquote, turn over the keys to the system to their clients? Okay, well, I, you know, I can give you a, a, a little uh, cookbook idea, and I will, but I, I want to emphasize something, and it's actually talking about the evolution of HA training. It's something that um, has, uh, has been, in my mind, as an important point to make every time I talk about HAA training and calibration calibration and that is that with audio we have a uh, an additional facet of the problem and you know I, I i work a lot with joel silver we just had a webinar a while back and uh, one of the things that um is is true about video is that when you take the video out of the box you set up the geometry between the screen and the projector and everything and then obviously you've got to tune the system uh, in audio, the fundamental, and I'll say the most important part of tuning the system is where you're going to sit, first of all, and where the speakers go, including the subwoofer. So I, I have a saying, uh, you can't calibrate a poorly designed system. So uh, and what that means is one of the first things that you'll do if you're going to be uh, working with a client to try to optimize the system is you may want to take a look at it and find out if he's got the center channel in the right place, if uh, he's sitting in, up against the back wall or the subs in the corner or, you know, some rookie mistake. But there's also other issues, other uh, uh, design uh, delicacies that you might be aware of that you could uh, update the system. Once you have that system properly laid out, once it's designed properly. The calibration becomes more straightforward. And what we were talking about, the auto EQ systems, they actually work a lot better. They actually work much better if the system is properly designed first. So swing back, calibration. Uh, first thing we do is we listen to the system, we measure it. So we want to hear what's going on. Our ears are our best measurement instrument. And uh, you know, I can listen to the system and, you know, all of a sudden, oh, uh, the center channel's out of polarity. Okay, I didn't need a fancy uh, tool to tell me that. My experience, my ears told me that. So right off the bat, you can discover a lot of uh, problems and thus solutions by just turning it on and listening to it. The old audiophile concept of, uh, of listening. And then very important second step, and I can't emphasize this enough. You got to make sure everything works. <laughs> and that sounds silly. You turn it on if it's either on or off, right? But that's not true. We have, we have uh, who knows how many channels of amplification, how many channels of processing, how many speakers, all these different complicated things. And guess what? Something could be out of whack and still making a sound. And it's not going to sound right. So uh, one of the fundamentals is learning and understanding how to do a field test and make sure that at least you've got some basic functionality in, uh, uh, and I, I mean correct fun functionality in all parts of the audio chain. Uh, so that, that's just super important. And then, uh, of course, tuning the system. And these days, that means uh, equalization. And uh, I, I think I made the point earlier, uh, a lot of the uh, AVRs, a lot of the processors out there just don't have the kind of uh, uh, 
I guess, uh, user control that a, a, a top calibrator would want. So I always recommend looking at adding a, uh, a, a processor on the subsystem at least. If you can get in there and, and a good, a guy that's, that's uh, been trained and, and has worked with it, he can, he can EQ subs in a reasonable period of time. Tremendous improvement. And then you can go back and click that auto button and see what it's gonna do. So uh, calibration, um, and of course, calibration rolls with the, the uh, punches. And you know some systems require emphasis on other things more than others. I think I'm, you're losing me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Okay. Uh, but besides your ears, what are some of the other tools that integrators need to uh, tune and calibrate a uh, home theater or audio system? Uh, well, the most powerful tool is your ears tied with your experience. So uh, that means that a really good calibrator is somebody who loves to listen. And that might mean movies, but, um, you know, without coming off as the uh, crazy audiophile, uh, the, uh, the fact is that musical uh, interest, listening to, uh, to music with the, the more, more of a focus on uh, some of the acoustical side of, so you could, there's more detail, there's more spatial information in the recording. And, and then that spatial information provides a, uh, a way to really hear whether or not the system is dialed in. So yeah, I'm a big ear guy, but uh, there was a question at the last CDO webinar, can you calibrate by ear? And the answer is kind of, but when you when it comes down to serious calibration with using the uh, uh, the concepts uh, and the tools that we have today, it's really not a good idea to to, to rely solely on the ears. So uh, a good real time analyzer RTA uh, is uh, is actually a, a, a really important tool. And there's there's a many different kinds of systems that can provide you with the data. Fundamentally, what you need is you need a measurement of the system that shows its frequency response from the low frequencies to the high frequencies. And that data tells you whether or not there are uh, distortions, resonances in the room, and those resonances are the most audible. And you can't calibrate them away without an equalizer, and you can't calibrate them away without knowing what the frequencies of those resonances are. And that's why you need the tool. I should also throw in there just for completeness, you can get rid of some of those resonances with speaker placement, and listener placement, but that's a whole nother discussion. So an RTA fundamentally, and you can do everything from uh, a, uh, the free room EQ wizard, REW, or some people call it RU. And uh, so that, that's great. Download it for free. Get yourself a USB mic and go to the races. And uh, but there's a lot of different, uh, completely satisfactory tools out there. I like Audio Tools. If you're a if you're a, a Apple hater, you, <laughs> you won't like the fact that it only runs on an iPad or an iPhone. But uh, I just like its simplicity. I like it. I like teaching it because it's it it just is very easy for most uh, integrators. They look at it, it makes sense. Oh, okay, yeah, I got it. And so I don't have to bang my head on the keyboard trying to teach him how to use that, uh, the audio tool. So that's that's one of my favorites. So, uh, so those lastly, are the main uh, Jerry, obviously you've listened to countless home audio systems over the years, uh, and you've got your own you know opinions, I'm sure, about what makes the differences between you know a good system and a great system you know the, the answer might be different for a system that you're listening to for movies and tv versus one for music but you know just in your opinion uh you know what are some of the attributes that can really lift a system from good to great yeah well that's that's interesting and and it's it, I, I would have to say that, um, you know, that we people talk about music being subjective. 
uh, or sound being subjective. Some people like lots of bass, some people like really loud, you know, all those things. But one of the things that I've always tried to keep as the center focus of HAA training is that there are certain fundamental uh, attributes of sound which are universal, okay? So we stay away from uh, how much bass you like, how much treble you like, uh, how loud do you like it? We, we stay away from those things and we focus on uh, specific key elements or specific key uh, descriptor, descriptors, sonic goals, we call them. Uh, in a nutshell, clarity, pretty easy to understand. Either the, dirt, the window's either clear or it's dirty. Focus, uh, the projector's either focused or it's not. Pretty easy to understand that we're talking about imaging. Uh, we're talking about uh, the smooth response. That's something that you can hear, but you can measure it more readily. Uh, we're talking about envelopment, meaning that you're completely immersed by the sound where uh, you really don't have an awareness of any kind of reproduction system in the room at all. You simply hear the imaging of the ambient sound field, the recorded ambient sound field, and then whatever uh, images of actors, explosions, you know, spaceships zipping by, all of those things are suspended in a three-dimensional space. Uh, and then of course, dynamics. And dynamics uh, is uh, a touchy one because dynamics requires, first of all, the system has to be able to, in many cases, recreate the reality of a uh, very powerful uh, real life scenario, a volcano, a depth charge, or perhaps just someone really plunking down on a Bosendorfer piano, tremendous dynamic range there. And it's very difficult for a system that doesn't have tremendous power capability and reserves to, to really even uh, come close to recreating that. And then the real problem with dynamics is that you have to also recreate the depth of quiet. So I'm giving you a complicated answer. I know you wanted me to, to you know, say, oh, it's this, but it's, it's looking at a balance of all those things. And uh, so uh, clarity, focus, development, smooth response, dynamics, and uh, that's, that's where we go. And if someone, if we can achieve all those things, and, and that's what we teach, we teach exactly how to change each one of those uh, uh, sonic goals, those metrics. We teach you what you have to change in the room to make each one right. After that, if somebody wants to crank up the bass control or you know whatever, it doesn't matter. But everybody is going to listen to that system and say, this sounds amazing. And, and that's uh, ultimately something that I've found over 20 years of doing this. I don't care who I've had, uh, they all like it. It, it. it really escapes the concept of subjectivity and preference. And I'll even add, uh, that in many cases, it's almost independent of the components that you use, speakers and so on and so forth. Great. Well, that's uh, exactly what we were looking for. We loved hearing about all those uh, those insights and, and having you share your expertise with us uh, on this podcast. So Jerry LeMay, again, from the Home Acoustics Alliance, we really appreciate your time and, and thank you very much for teaching us more about audio. Well... My pleasure. Ask me back and I'll do it again. I really enjoyed it. Sounds great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.